morality is doing the right thing regardless of what you're told. Fanatic religion is doing what you're told regardless of what is right. That's from H. L. Mencken. And now if you didn't win the lottery, I have some wise words for you in the form of a joke, a theosophical joke, where a man is talking with God and has this following conversation. He says, Lord, what is a million years like to you? To which God responds, it's like a second. And God, what is a million dollars like to you? To which God says, it's like a penny. The man then says to God, God, can I have a penny? <laughs> to which God replies, just a second. We got four quips from Keith, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, who lived 1874 to 1936. These four following ones say, uh, first one, mysticism is, trans is a transcendental form of common sense. Angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. <laughs> there are two ways of getting home, and one of them is to stay there. And lastly, let your religion be less of a theory and more of a love affair. I like those four quotes. So let's dig, uh, dive into today's uh, topic. We're at this natural world critical cycle here to which millennia of, of people before us have all celebrated in various ways and even driving here um, with a little bit of this thing called fog, which is a, a rare, fairly new thing happening here. Uh, it's got its own built-in metaphor to life. Uh, if you drove through any of that fog in here, you know it can go very thick, to which you can only see your surrounding limited space and maybe you see a light up ahead. That light up ahead, whether it's the taillights or something, it gives you some sense of hope and purpose. And that's really all any of us ever know to some degree. We only have this moment, we can see clearly around us, and we have faith that what's ahead of us that's in the unknown is there. That God that sees around corners, and especially those corners in our own life, are really the big deepening faith lesson for all of us, to deepen our trust, deepen our trust, our, our faith in the living God. So let me give you a little bit of background about the other traditions that are here. Uh, we have Day of the Dead, De los Muertos. We have uh, Sawang, which is more of a Celtic tradition. We have Halloween. We have all these harvest cycles. And uh, the basics of, of this, um, a lot of them have to do with the natural world, the ending of the harvest season, and the preparation for what was called the dark half of the year. And you can imagine that before all of our modern technology, especially light bulbs, all these things that we take somewhat for granted in our daily life, just flipping on a switch, that all of this had a bit of a deeper impact upon our ancestors. But it was still seen as this liminal time when the boundary between this world and the other world thin. This concept is still active, it's still alive, and it was this time of the year that the celebration kind of manifests in this world as, what do we do? What do we do when that might become the reality? Some of these things involve, and you think about this, this may be an opportunity to simply send some prayer energy right now to anyone who's gone before you, anyone who's already in the next realm. That's essentially the message of all these other traditions, is to send them some prayer energy, 
to assist those who have gone before us in their own spiritual journey, their own spiritual evolution. And a lot of the traditions actually come from this tension between fearing them, if they're going to be coming here at this point in time because the, the space is thin, there is a combination of both fear and respect. And that actually goes into the whole trick-or-treat piece. If you uh, don't get a treat, there may be a trick involved, involving that uh, either it's a household or uh, some other thing. So all of this, it, it goes across traditions, cultures, uh, it's the natural cycle of the year, thin space. It's also the belief that the souls will come back to have a, have a place to, to meet with ancestors. Um, I was surprised. I, I finally went to Dia de los Muertos on 6th Street in San Pedro last year. Wow, that is a popular festival. At the Garden Church, I was there um, as a minister presence in the garden, they had 1,500 people walk through the gates of the, the garden last year. That is a lot of people in that, if you've ever been there, to that, uh, what once was just a simple plot of land there on 6th Street is now um, an urban garden, a sanctuary, um, and they have, um, well, an active uh, garden that, that uh, is great, so I invite you to check that out. But before we delve into all those other um, pieces, I want to underscore something about our tradition here. Something that kind of blends in with all of this, blends in with actually the reason why this is here. Having everything to do with thin space, liminal space. And I already talked a little bit at the beginning about how people come here and are drawn to it, but they don't exactly articulate it as to the specifics but I should suggest that there is a correspondence, spiritual correspondence, that something happens as you step into the space and it changes you, shifts you in larger and smaller ways. And after prayer service this last Wednesday, there was a woman who had never been here before and she was with her husband. They walk out and they say, every church should be like this. And I thought to myself, hmm, that's intriguing thought and idea. There's something that's communicated within the architecture and the space that blends the interior with the exterior, and that has everything to do with this time of the year as well. That liminal space where this world somehow gets closer to the next realm. Another thing about Swedenborgian theology, not many people know about Swedenborg still, but does theology, theosophy still continue to impact people's lives? And I like to use the phrase, people are Swedenborgian, they just don't know it yet. <laughs> a lot of those beliefs are there, we just give it language and a system and a church. But Swedenborg even takes us to the next level by saying that every thought we have is inspired to some degree by the spiritual dimension. You can almost go to the extreme on the spiritual side by just discerning what thoughts are coming to us at any given moment. Eckhart Tolle has a huge, profound impact in book by just simply saying, can you, if you can't, if you can't uh, stop your thoughts, which is pretty impossible, if you've tried it, can you, can you have a, no, a period of no thoughts right now? See if you can. If you can't, he suggests this, simply observe that it is a thought and don't take it completely seriously. See if you can smile at your thoughts. In other words, recognize that there is you existing at a deeper dimension, a deeper reality that transcends what the thought is. Descartes got it all wrong. He said, I think, therefore I am. That was the one thing he could point to that was constant. He was always thinking. And he said, this is the very core of existence. And he got it completely wrong. We are beyond thought. The Old Testament actually got this more directionally correct. Moses in the fire, I am that I am. I am. I can sit there, and if you've ever deeply meditated, you've probably experienced existence or a feeling. And if you experience a feeling of joy and bliss, 
Well, first of all, to try and remain there if you can. Notice that you're not in the rational thought. Thinking is not a part of it because the mind is great at lots of things. It's also incredibly great at making us uh, a disturbed animal. That's what it does. You can quote me. I'm on, I'm on record for that one. <laughs> yes, we are divine creatures. And we have to recognize we have this thing called thought. Where are those thoughts coming from? We have a little bit of a cartoon imagery on that when we get into this theologically. It's kind of like the, uh, if you remember those uh, cartoons, mostly Tom and Jerry, it's an angel appears on one shoulder and it whispers something in the air and then there's the cartoon devil that's whispering in this ear and you know it's actually pretty accurate it's like the selfish desire or the the good altruistic thing that you know is right and is aligned with god which voice do we usually listen to thin space we're in thin space and while the term thin space may not be traced back there are some beautiful celtic phrases uh, if you've ever been to Ireland, you know that there are all these places. They're usually green. They're surrounded by green greenery. But here's a Celtic saying. Heaven and earth are only three feet apart. But in thin places, that distance is even shorter. And I will put something forward here and now. This is one of those spaces. One of those places where heaven is a little bit closer. The Celts would talk about places and locations, mystical places where the veil between heaven and earth is very thin, past and present and future seem to collide in these spaces. It is as if the visitor witnesses or even experiences an ancient reality in just a passing moment. There's a luminous quality to the air, to the light, Rugged sea coasts, rocky mountain peaks, and windswept beaches calling out Ireland's thin places to pilgrims, to pilgrims to this very day. This space is on that list of thin space. This other writer says about uh, where that term comes from, thin space, from the Celtic tradition, and speaking about the qualities of thin space, she says this, these places bring feelings and emotions, realizations and awareness to the fore. It is as if the line between all that is sacred and human meet for just a moment. In a thin place, something beyond words causes our spines to tingle, as if awakening our souls. Even our thoughts seem to be swept away in the moment, and something deep within our being touches a luminous seed of knowledge. You may visit a thin place as part of a group, but each person will experience something different. One person's thin place may be very thick to another. If you find your thin place, no matter how many others are there with you, you will feel drawn by something powerful yet unspoken. Despite the compa companionship of others, you will be lost in a solitary world between past and present. It is in this liminal space, this thin space that I invite you all to enter into more fully into this present sacred moment. This place that connects us all. The place that we experience individually but we're also experiencing collectively. And I'll invite you one step further just to place some energy within your body. It's a m great mystery in itself that as we are finite human creatures with a definitive edge here on where our physical bodies meet, there is something within us that transcends this physical space and time. That thing that will also be there no matter what age our physical body is, that is the same, the constant. And you can place some attention there now if you feel that liminal space within your physical body. So what does all this have to do with our lesson today? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
The gospel story extends this liminal space to the life of Jesus Christ. We enter into this New Testament scripture story. Everywhere Jesus goes or is about to go, there is excitement about what possibilities may be there. And this story is no exception. Jesus is existing with his disciples in that liminal space. People can recognize the healing story in the gospel. Here we have a blind beggar sitting on the roadside. And when he hears that it's Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And of course, he did not. Um, here's another theological lesson with that. He had to repeat himself only more loudly to get Jesus' attention. And it's only at that point where Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Now you have to imagine this situation. Jesus is coming into town, gets the attention of Jesus, and what does Jesus do? He slows things down into what I will call this liminal space. There's no sense of feeling rushed or hurried. And that is captured in the, in the gospel by Jesus stood still. And there's another element that is entering into this, which is Jesus is always remain, remaining anchored to this deeper space, this deeper stillness. And Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? That line in particular leaps off the page. Well, I can imagine it back then in that context. That is also the question each of us are asking in some different way. What are we asking for Jesus to do for us? What is in your life that you are asking? And maybe you need to ask again, a bit louder, a bit more vocal, to get Jesus' attention. What can Jesus do for you now? The question is out there, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I think thin space carries some of these, uh, carries special context to that question. If you're trying to remain connected to God, you come specifically to places that are consecrated, where that feeling of heaven is just a bit closer. This is one of those spaces. It's a great thing to come here and know that if you feel that and you're asking for a prayer, you're trying to connect, you're trying to lift up your prayer to the Lord, this is thin space for that to occur. Perhaps it is a health issue. Perhaps you're feeling anxious, worried about what's happening in the world. Perhaps you're, perhaps you're looking ahead to this coming week. There's some big meetings, some big appointments. Perhaps you're simply trying to let go of the past. Whatever it is that you're holding in your mind right now, I invite you in this thin space to feel it deeply. And you can ask right now, silently, for that assistance. When you do ask, and you come to the Lord. The Lord is present with you. Just like the blind man who says in our scripture story, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. And if we're going to critically break down this miracle story of the blind man asking Jesus to see, we can also recognize that a big part of the healing process has to do with a man's faith and belief that Jesus can heal him. Without that belief, the blind man would not have shouted. He wouldn't have shouted even more emphatically the second time and gotten the attention of Jesus. In the same way, if we're going to be authentic in our spiritual life, 
The Lord hears all of those sincere prayers, the meditations of our heart, especially in thin space. In the same fashion, we are all in need these days of increasing our faith, our belief, that when, when we come to the Lord with our big problems, we're being listened to. Something is happening. The other great metaphor of that story, even though that person in the story was physically blind, to some degree we're all spiritually blind, just like the character in the gospel. So part of our prayer may simply be not only the healing of our faith and our belief, it is a miracle when our eyes spiritually become cleansed and we see everything as it is, infinite, to quote William Blake. We can all use more, uh, well, thin space in our lives where we're feeling this. We can also increase our faith. And as Jesus said to him, it's the message for all of us as well, which I'll end with today. Go, your faith has made you well. Amen. We have a couple forms of offering here at Wayfarers Chapel.